Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Bizarre of Bad Dreams, Thrilling Stories by Stephen King. Dane reads. So, uh, I do, do we have a blurb for this I can read? Do we? I think we do. Yeah, it's a long old blurb, but it's good because it kind of covers all the different stories. So I'm going to read the blurb out to you, and I'm going to give you the list of the stories. Then we're going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, the number one best-selling writer presents a generous collection of stories, some brand new, all assembled together for the first time in one book, each with a revelatory introduction. Stephen King has dazzled readers with his genius as a writer of novellas and short stories ever since his first collection, Night Shift, was published. There's something to be said for a shorter, more intense experience, writes King. It can be invigorating, sometimes even shocking, like a beautiful curio for sale laid out on a cheap blanket at a street bazaar. In The Bazaar of Bad Dreams, there is a curio for every reader. A man who keeps reliving the exact same life, repeating his mistakes over and over. A columnist who kills people by writing their obituaries. A poignant tale about the end of the human race in a firework competition between neighbours which reaches an explosive climax. There are also intriguing connections between the stories. Themes of morality, guilt, the afterlife, and what we would do differently if we could see into the future or correct the mistakes of the past. Effervescent yet bittersweet, juxtaposing the everyday against the unexpected, these stories comprise one of King's finest gifts to both his constant reader and new audience. King introduces each with a fascinating autobiographical passage about its origins or his motivation for writing it, giving a unique insight into his craft which will delight the millions inspired by his celebrated non-fiction title, On Writing. I made them especially for you, says King. Feel free to examine them, but please be careful. The best of them have teeth. And yes, mentioning the little introductory essays, that reminded me of uh, the way that, that uh, Isaac Asimov does his short story collections, and it's actually, generally, with Isaac Asimov, I find his introductions to his stories arguably more interesting than the stories themselves, and I love the stories themselves. So it's cool to see King's take on it here. So as for the contents, we have Introduction, Mile 81, Premium Harmony, Batman and Robin have an altercation, The Dune, Bad Little Kid, A Death, The Bone Church, Morality, Afterlife, Er, uh, Herman Wook is Still Alive, Under the Weather, Blockade Billy, Mr. Yummy, Tommy, The Little Green God of Agony, That Bus is Another World, Obits, Drunken Fireworks, and Summer Thunder. So let's jump on in. So here we have Mile 81, and this is basically, it's almost a bit like Christine, it's about a, like a haunted vehicle. And we get this little nod to Lock and Key, which is obviously written by uh, Joe Hill, King's son. It says, after some interior debate, Pete put this into his saddlebag along with his magnifying glass, the latest issue of Lock and Key, and a few double stuff Oreos in a baggie. To me, a baggie is like the little plastic thing that you, when you buy drugs. So I don't know how you'd get Oreos in there, unless you're buying a lot of drugs. We get this great threat by a dad to his kids. He says, Blake, Johnny began, if you don't stop kicking daddy's seat, daddy will have to take his trusty butcher knife and amputate Blakey's little feetsies at the ankle. Don't know if you should be saying that to kids, to be honest. I like this little line. He guessed little girls divided naturally into two groups, tomboys and dirt haters. Like his Ellen, this one was a dirt hater. So we're going to move on to, I think, Premium Harmony. Oh no, uh, looks like, oh, we're at the introduction to the Dune. Uh, it's hard to tell because he doesn't put the title of the the uh, story that we're currently on in the header, which is a shame because that would make it a lot easier to review. But anyway, I'm going to read this out, um, this introduction, because it's only a couple of paragraphs. So, as I said in the note to Batman and Robin, sometimes, once in a great while, you get the cup with the handle already attached. God, how I love that. You're just going about your business thinking of nothing in particular, and then kaboom, a story arrives, special delivery, perfect and complete. The only thing you have to do is transcribe it. I was in Florida walking our dog on the beach. Because it was January and cold, I was the only one out there. Up ahead I saw what looked like writing in the sand. When I got closer I saw it was just a trick of sunlight and shadow, but writers' minds are junk heaps of odd information, and it made me think of an old quote from somewhere, it turned out to be Omar Khayyam, the moving finger writes and having writ moves on. That in turn made me think of some magical place where an invisible moving finger would write terrible things in the sand, and I had this story. It has one of my very favourite endings. Maybe not up there with August Heat by W.F. Harvey, that one's a classic, but in the same neighbourhood. I actually thought that the ending to this one was quite predictable. Uh, this is about like an old retired judge who sees names written in the sand and they kind of foretell who's going to die. Um, but I like that moving finger quote as well because Agatha Christie has a book titled The Moving Finger for the same reason, or at least presumably so. So this is the introduction here to Bad Little Kid and I, I want to mention this one. Because he's talking about Bad Boy, which is an absolute banger. In fact, after I read this introduction, I had to go and listen to the song. Life is full of big questions, isn't it? Fate or destiny? Heaven or hell? Love or attraction? Reason or impulse? Beatles or Stones? 
For me, it was always the Stones. The Beatles were just too soft once they became Jupiter in the solar system of pop music. My wife used to refer to Sir Paul McCartney as old dog eyes, and that kind of summed up how I felt. But the early Beatles, uh, they played honest rock, and I still listen to those old tracks, mostly covers, with love. Sometimes I'm even moved to get up and dance a little. One of my favourites was their version of the Larry Williams classic Bad Boy, with John Lennon singing lead in a hoarse, urgent voice. I particularly like the exhorted punchline, Now Junior, behave yourself! At some point I decided I wanted to write a story about a bad little kid who moved into the neighbourhood. Not a kid who was the devil's spawn, not a kid who was possessed by some ancient demon a la the exorcist, but just bad for bad's sake, bad to the bone, the apotheosis of all the bad little kids who ever were. I saw him in shorts and with a propeller beanie on his head. I saw him always causing trouble and absolutely never behaving himself. This is the story that grew around that little kid, an evil version of Sluggo, Nancy's friend from the funny pages. An electronic version has appeared in France and also in Germany, where Bad Boy was no doubt a part of the Beatles Star Club repertoire. This is its first publication in English. Great uh, little bit here as well. I didn't mind that she was soft-headed either. I would have in time, I suppose, but I was only nine when she died, still at an age when kids accept pretty much everything that's put before them. I think that's a blessed way to be. If everyone was soft in the head, do you think we'd still have wars? Balls we would. We get some references to Mandy Patinkin, who is, uh, he played Inigo Montoya in The Princess Bride. Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. And we get this, um, this woman gives main character's dad some boots. The problem is that they're hobnail boots and this guy wears them down into a mine and so they, they spark and cause an explosion or at least that's what the bad kid wants us to think. But um, they reminded me of Captain Vimes, Commander Samuel Vimes in um, in the Discworld, Terry Pratchett's Discworld and he has this theory, the trickle down theory of, uh, the trickle down boots theory of socio-economic unfairness. So basically the theory is that a rich man will spend $50 on a good pair of boots but they'll last him all of his wife and keep his feet dry. Whereas a poor man will spend five dollars on a pair of boots they'll last for six months so after ten sets of six months so what uh, five years he'll have spent the same amount of money on his boots uh, but his feet will still be wet and he'll still be paying more you know so it kind of shows how rich people can afford better stuff and it lasts longer and actually saves them money and so uh, we go we get to the point where uh, the main character is due for execution a cold prairie wind was blowing when Bradley left Needle Manor he zipped his coat and stood taking long breaths, trying to get as much outside as possible into his insides and as fast as he could. It wasn't the execution per se, except for the warden's bizarre blue shirt. It seemed as prosaic as getting a tetanus shot or a shingles vaccination. That was actually the horror of it. Kind of the horror of how normal it is, you know? King writing about poetry and uh, there's a reference to Charles Rowland to the Dark Tower came, a Browning poem, which is obviously um, hugely influential on the Dark Tower. But unfortunately his poems kind of sucked, so I'm going to read you the first stanza of The Bone Church here. It's prose poetry, which I normally like, but King's general prose is so good that I just think he's better at prose than poetry, you know? If you want to hear, buy me another drink. Ah, uh, this is slot, but never mind, what isn't? There were 32 of us went into that green store. 30 days in the green and only three who rose above it. Three rose above the green, three made it to the top. Manning and Revoir and me. And what does that book say? The famous one. Only I am left to tell you. I'll die of the drink in bed as many obsessed whoresons do. It's just not very good, to be honest, mate. And then King here, another introduction, and he's talking about morality, and this was interesting. He says, Word got around that I would write papers for students who found themselves in a bind. I had a sliding scale for this service. If the student got an A, my fee was $20. I got $10 for a B. A grade of C was a wash and no money changed hands. For a D or an F, I promised my client that I would pay him or her $20. I made sure I would never have to pay because I couldn't afford to and I was sly. It embarrasses me to say that, but it's the truth. I wouldn't take on a project unless the student in need could provide at least one paper he or she had written so I could copy the style. I didn't need to do this a lot, thank God, but when I had to, when I was broke and simply couldn't live without a burger and fries at the Bears Den in Memorial Union, I did. And that brings us on to his story, Morality. And uh, so basically this is the story about a guy who's finished his life and is in purgatory and he's kind of doomed to repeat the same mistakes over and over again. But the guy he's talking to says this, um, I'd ask if you know what a shirtwaist is, Bill, but since I know you don't, I'll tell you, a woman's blouse. At the turn of the century, I and my partner, Max Blank, owned a business called the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Profitable business, but the women who worked there were a large pain in the keister, always sneaking out to smoke and, this was worse, stealing stuff, which they would put in their purses or tuck up under their skirts. So we locked the doors to keep them in during their shifts and searched them on their way out. Long story short, the damn place caught fire one day. Max and I escaped by going up to the reef and down the fire escape. 
many of the women were not so lucky. Although, let's be honest and admit there's lots of blame to go around. Smoking in the factory was strictly verboten, but plenty of them did it anyway, and it was a cigarette that started the blaze. Fire Marshal said so. Max and I were tried for manslaughter and acquitted. And I think I've heard of like stories of that happening in the real world, you know? And I like this, so Harris, again the guy, he says, There is a folk tale that before birth every human soul knows all the secrets of life and death in the universe. But then, just before birth, an angel leans down, puts his finger to the new baby's lips and whispers, Shh! Harris touches his philtrum. According to the story, this is the mark left by the angel's finger. Every human being has one. And I ended up looking at myself in the mirror. Alright, so, Ur, and this is a story he wrote originally for the Kindle. A great quote here to start with. A pretty good school, Don said, is one nobody has ever heard of outside a 30 mile radius. People call it a pretty good school because they have no evidence to the contrary, and most people are optimists, although they may claim they are not. People who call themselves realists are often the biggest optimists of all. Does that make you a realist? Wesley once asked him. I think the world is mostly populated by shitheads, Don Allman responded. You take it from there. I agree, I think I'm a realist and I also think the world is mostly populated by shitheads. And uh, the main guy is a teacher and it says he sometimes fantasised about a juicy co-ed wearing a t-shirt that said I will screw you for an A. But this never happened. And we get this line which I thought was interesting, as a vegan. It wasn't his less than athletic sexual ability that ended their relationship however. It wasn't the fact that Ellen was a vegan who ate tofurkey for Thanksgiving. I mean, I will point out there's a study that showed that vegans have stronger erections that happen more frequently and last longer. So, have that because we don't have as much shit going through our veins. And a great line here, it occurred to him that Spike was a kind of methadone for lovers and better than going cold turkey. Basically this Kindle has access to all of these like unpublished works from authors in other dimensions. So like Hemingway, he didn't kill himself in another dimension and he wrote more stuff. Um, and so I'm gonna read all of, all of this little bit out because I think it's interesting. Chapter one. A man's life was five days long, Cortland believed. The first was the one that taught you. The second was the one you taught. The third and fourth were the ones you worked. The last one was the one that outlived you. That was the winter dog. Cortland's winter dog was Negrita, but he thought of it only as the scarecrow dog. Liquid rose up in Wesley's throat. He ran for the sink, bent over it, and struggled to keep the beer down. His gorge settled, and instead of turning on the water to rinse puke down the drain, he cupped his hands under the flow and splashed it on his sweaty skin. That was better. Then he went back to the Kindle and stared down at it. A man's life was five dogs long, Cortland believed. Somewhere, at some college a lot more ambitious than Moore of Kentucky, there was a computer program to read books and identify the writers by their stylistic ticks and tocks, which was supposed to be as unique as fingerprints or snowflakes. Wesley had a vague recollection that this computer program had been used to identify the author of a pseudonymous novel called Primary Colours. The program had whiffled through thousands of writers in a matter of hours or days and had come up with a news magazine columnist named Joe Klein, who later owned up to his literary paternity. Wesley thought that if he submitted Cortland's dog to that computer, it would spit out Ernest Hemingway's name. In truth, he didn't think he needed a computer. He picked up the Kindle with hands that were now shaking badly. What are you? he asked. And we get this one. Kindle, isn't it? the waitress asked. I got one for Christmas and I love it. I'm reading my way through all of Jodie Picoult's book books. Oh, probably not all of them, Wesley said. Huh? She's probably got another one done already, that's all I meant. And James Pattinson's probably written one since he got up this morning, she said, and went off chortling. No, his ghostwriters have probably written one for him, mate. So here we have Herman Wick is still alive. I think I said his name right, I don't know. Uh, trigger warnings for sexual assault on minors. Jasmine is dubious. The glorified shack in Mars Hill that her folks call home doesn't have room, and she wouldn't want to stay with them even if it did. She hates her parents. With good reason, Brenda knows. It was Jazzy's own father who broke her in a week after her 15th birthday. Her mother knew what was going on and did nothing. When Jazz went to her in tears, her ma said, you got nothing to worry about, he's had his nuts cut. Jesus. All right, on to Under the Weather. And this is about ad guys, and they're debating this, uh, the claims they can say about this new like Viagra rival. Uh, yes, Billy, I get it, the FDA will get it too, and they won't like it. In fact, they could make us take ads with a cut line like that out of circulation, which would cost a bundle, not to mention a very good client. Why? It's almost a bleat. Because it isn't 10 times bigger, and it isn't 10 times better. Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, Potens, they all have about the same effectiveness when it comes to penis elevation. Do your research, kiddo. And a little refresher course in advertising law wouldn't hurt. Wanna say Blowhard's bran muffins are 10 times tastier than Big Mouth's bran muffins? Have at it, taste is a subjective judgement. What gets your prick hard though, and for how long? Okay, he says in a small voice. Here's the other half. 10 times more anything is, speaking in erectile dysfunction terms, pretty limp. It went out of vogue around the same time as two C's and a K. He looks blank. 
It's how advertising guys used to refer to their TV ads on the soaps back in the 50s. Stands for two cunts in a kitchen. And that amount of fucking just ridiculous sexism is still prevalent and rife in the industry. That's why I got out of it. Uh, I think this is interesting because he references uh, one of his own books but also shows how like characters can take beliefs from authors. So he says, some stand-in for me in one of the early novels, I think it was Ben Mears in Salem's Lot, says it's a bad idea to talk about a story you're planning to write. It's like pissing it out on the ground is how he puts it. Sometimes though, especially if I'm feeling enthusiastic, I find it hard to take my own advice. That was the case with Mr. Yummy. And basically, this story uh, has got a gay character and deals with AIDS and someone was trying to encourage him not to write it and he was like, well I don't think there's anything a writer shouldn't be allowed to write about. Which is fair. Uh, and they're talking about uh, the Eiffel Tower and someone says, did you know there was an artist protest when it was under construction? No, but I'm not surprised. The French. The novelist Leon Bloy called it a truly tragic street lamp. Calhoun looked at the puzzle, saw what Bloy had meant and laughed. It did look like a street lamp, sort of. Some other artist or writer, I can't remember who, claimed that the best view of Paris was from the Eiffel Tower because it was the only view of Paris without the Eiffel Tower in it. And uh, yeah, I've heard that story before. Wasn't it Guy de Maupassant? I'm not sure. All right, the little green god of agony. And this character is uh, the sixth richest man, not just in America, but in the world. Three of the other five mega rich guys were dark complected fellows who wore robes and drove around desert countries in armored Mercedes Benzes. But I'm pretty sure that all of the richest are currently American. They're mostly the tech guys, you know. All right, then we have that bus is another world. I'm gonna skip past that, move on to obits. This is about the guy who writes the obituaries. And they uh, come true. And here's one of his quick and nasty obituaries. Jack Briggs, noted for his horrific performance in last year's Holy Rollers as a talking bookshelf in love with Jennifer Lawrence, was found dead in his hotel room, surrounded by some of his favourite powdered treats. He joins the 27 Club, which also contains such noted substance abusers as Robert Johnson, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Kurt Cobain and Amy Winehouse. I'm fascinated by the 27 Club. I always thought I was going to end up becoming a member. I'm glad I didn't. Someone says when they get writer's block, they, they type, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog three times real fast. It opens the creative floodgates. And uh, that's interesting just because it's it was originally, it, it's a, a sentence that uses all of the letters in the English language and it was originally uh, used to test typewriters to make sure that they worked okay, which I think is cool. And uh, just this final one thing that I want to read out, this is his introduction to Drunken Fireworks, he said, Here's an anecdote too good not to share and I've been telling it at public appearances for years now. My wife does the major shopping for us. She says there'd never be a vegetable in the house otherwise, but she sometimes sends me on emergency errands. So I was in the local supermarket one afternoon on a mission to find batteries in a non-stick fry pan. As I meandered my way up the housewares aisle, having already stopped for a few other absolute necessities, cinnamon buns and potato chips, a woman came around the far end riding one of those motorized cars. She was a Florida snowbird archetype, about 80, perm to perfection, and as darkly tanned as a cordovan shoe. She looked at me, looked away, then did a double take. I know you, she said. You're Stephen King. You write those scary stories. That's all right. Some people like them, but not me. I like uplifting stories like that Shawshank Redemption. I wrote that too, I said. No, you didn't, she said, and went on her way. Obviously, he did, so that's kind of funny. So overall, The Bizarre of Bad Dreams by Stephen King. Uh, some of the stuff I liked the most was the introductory essays. It's very Isaac Asimov, and I love that. Some of the stories in this were better than others, as you always get with a, a collection like this. I mean, some of my favorites, I enjoyed Mile 81, which was the first story. We've got the contents list here, that would help. Uh, Batman and Robin have an altercation, that was good. That was about uh, like dementia. Um, Bad Little Kid wasn't as good as I thought it was gonna be, to be honest. Um, what else have we got? Yeah, some of that, that bus is another world was good. Uh, the poems, not so good. Obits was great. Overall though, I did enjoy this. I gave it a four out of five. I think even King at his worst is better than most at their best, you know? Uh, and I'm glad that I read this one and another Stephen King ticked off my list. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Bizarre of Bad Dreams by Stephen King. As always, don't forget to let me know what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.